how does I go and install this? Let me look at let me look at this device. Trying to see. What is this? Is this a Galaxy Tab? This has about 171, if we're going to believe um, this. I'm pretty sure this is an older version of it, so it will be 171 uh, pixels per inch. So this falls into the medium range. So this, when I install it, it should get the medium icon. Well, how does Android know what icon to use in the case of a medium? density device and what I kind of use in the case of a high de uh, density or low def density. It does it based on what's called a resource qualifier. All right. What is a resource qualifier? <coughs> a resource qualifier is where you say that a certain resource folder gets used under certain conditions. Now what might those conditions be? Those conditions might be the screen density. So in this case, with our drawables, these are the images that will be used in the case of a high density machine or a high density screen. This is the one that will be used in a medium, this will be used in a low. So screen density is one way that we could set up a resource qualifier. We could actually set up a resource qualifier for any number, any of these things. We could actually physically have a different screen layout depending on the uh, density of the screen. Or we could have different text on the screen depending on the density of the, string, uh, of the screen. All right. Let's go in here and I'm going to violate my rules. I'm going to make I'm going to paste another layout folder here. Let me do that. Let's do this. New folder. And I will call it, parent folder will be resources, and I'll call it layout dash M D P I. All right. And then I'm going to copy this file from here to here. Now, this will be the layout that will be used on medium density devices. All right. 
I could create several of these. I could create one for low density, and I could create one for medium density, or I could create one for high density. All right, let's go in here and I'm going to change that from a string in my string file to a hard-coded string. Now, we know that that's not a good idea, but I'm just being a little lazy here. So if I go and connect this up and run this application, Screen says it might be a little hard to see. Let's zoom in. But the thing on the top says medium density. Now, if this were a low density, it wouldn't say that. It would use the regular layout. The point is, is I can define layouts based on the density of the screen. Now, what are other qualifiers I could use? I could use qualifiers for the density of the screen. I can use qualifiers for the um, size of the screen. Large screen, medium screen, small screen. So therefore, if I'm developing an app that's going to work on a phone and a tablet, I don't have to develop two apps. Right? There's a lot more space on a tablet. I have a lot more real estate. I can do more things on a tablet than I can do on a small phone, small screen size. So what I can do is I could actually develop a different screen for the tablet and make things bigger or add more images or whatever I wanted to do and then make a smaller layout for the phone. And I do that via the resource qualifier. If you look here, if we were to Google Android resource qualifiers. This will show you a list of the different kinds of, of things that you can put and create different resources for, alternate resources. You can set it based on the mobile country phone, which deals with the mobile network carrier that the phone is on. You can set a qualifier to apply different resources for a different language. You can supply something if the layout is left to right or right to left. All right, which means you could make, if you were de uh, developing a application um, here in, you know, in the United States and typically Western European countries, the stuff goes, writing goes from the left to the right. Well, other countries, the writing goes from right to left. I could actually choose to have a different layout of my screen and qualify it oops, based on whether the layout direction was left to right or right to left. So if I was doing something for the Middle East, um, I could have it oriented, I have the screen actually oriented a different way to make it more accommodating for them. Smallest width, available width, available height, screen size, screen aspect, and so on down the line. Even if the device is displaying in a car dock, I can use different resources. Then we've seen this one before with the icons, screen pixel density, touch screen type, whether there's a keyboard available or not, and so on down the line. By being able to plug in different resource files based on all these different factors, that gives us a tremendous amount of flexibility in developing our application. So we can truly make our application localized or internationalized simply by setting different languages, 
setting different screen orientations, and so on. All right? This is kind of slick, whether it's night or not. All right? And so on down the line. Let's look at one of the most obvious, uh, obviously beneficial ones, and one that we can do pretty quickly. And that is, if we had um, uh, if, if we had a second set of resources here um, for a different language. So let's go, and I'm going to get rid of this layout, other layout file, because that served its purpose. And I'm going to create a values folder, and I'm going to extend it with a dash fr. Dash fr meaning that that's the language code in this case. All right. So I'm going to create a strings file that will display if the device is set to French. All right? And I could do this for as many languages as I had translators for. I could do it for Spanish or, uh, again, German, any language. So let's go and create this folder. Oops. All right, so there's my values fr folder. I'm going to copy screen uh, uh, the strings file from here to here. Then I'm going to go through and you know, let's go to Google Translate. Simple trip, trip calculator from English to French is, I'll have to take their word for it. I'm going to go copy this into my file. Example spelled a little differently. I'll go and copy that in. I'll do this down the line for each of these things. Actually, I lied. I'll do it for the first three because we all know how to use Google Translate. All right. So now, this is in a values.fr folder. All right. That means that the Android operating system recognizes that if the device is set to have a language of French, use this to get the string XML values instead of the default one, which is just in values. So let's go now and let's set this device to be French. So I'll go in here. Under settings. Go under location and security. No, that's not it. 
display settings, da na na na, locale and text. Set locale, and I'll go in and I'll set this to French. I'll go back to my home page, and you'll notice already some of these have different titles already. For example, calendar is spelled different. All right? The camera is spelled different. YouTube, apparently in French, is still YouTube, all right? Or, probably more than likely, they didn't supply a, a alternate text version. Like, for example, Amazon Kindle. They might not have supplied a French file for that, a French uh, strings file. Likewise, all shared might not have, uh, New York Times might not have, and all that. But, let's look at our application now. So we take our application, I'm going to plug this guy in, and I'm going to run the application. And, oops. It's going to go do its thing. And, if we look, Lo and behold, the three or four things that I translated to French, simple calculateur de probois, calculer point, whatever that means, I don't know. I had two years of high school French. Uh, <laughs> I can't guarantee the pronunciation here. But the point is, it's clearly it's using that. Clearly it's using the right one. Now, that's the great thing about this. I didn't have to touch my code because 15% is 15% regardless, right? The, the logic stays the same. What's going to stay, what was going to be different is the labels. Now, I can put resource qualifiers on anything. So I could put resource qualifiers on the image and if I wanted to, show the flag of France if the device was set to have a locale of France as opposed to a flag of the United States if it was set to the United States. So I can customize just about any of these resources based on any number of factors. All right, we saw the, the, the density of the screen was one. We saw the um, language or the locale as the other. And Android just uses those resources and allows you to swap out those resources without having to like rewrite, recompile, redo anything with, with the application. Let me go and set this guy back to being in the USA. That's always my uh, uh, fear when I do this. That's why I usually pick French because I can at least kind of recognize some of the words, is what if I change it to a language and I can't read the settings to change it back to English? <laughs> yeah, that's always a concern. But I can read enough French to be able to set it back to United States English. And if I go run this again, we're back to it displaying in English. And again, didn't really recompile it, didn't do anything, just changed the setting on that. So anything you see here on the resources side, we could change depending on, again, any number of factors. We could, for example, have a different icon for the French than we had for the Americans if we wanted to. We could have a different screen layout for French. We could have a different um, strings values, which we actually did. So any of these 
resources that we used, we can set based on a number of different characteristics of the device to provide an alternate resource if that device is used. We can even, if we want to, mix and match. Now mixing and matching gets a little hairy, right? Because what if I were to set a string file or values resource for a high definition device and I also set a different resource file, different values, for a French device? What would happen on a French high definition device? Well, I don't know. All right. But someone knows, and that someone is Google Developer. And if we look at Android resource qualifiers, it will tell you the order and the precedence that these things take. Somewhere near the bottom of this reference page. All right. We can combine that to say drawable EN RUS land to be devices in the United States that are set to English that are in landscape. So we can combine all those resource qualifiers. And again it shows you how somewhere down the line um, the process it goes through in finding it. And here's an example. How does Android find the most, um, the most relevant um, device? The point is it can get a little hairy if you start using a lot of resource qualifiers and if you start combining them. Um, again, the main thing I want to emphasize in this class, uh, the main resource qualifiers I think are relevant for this class relate to the density of the screens. Right? Because with images, you're likely going to want to have different density or different size images to accommodate the different densities of the screen. So images and density. We will do at least one example of an internationalized application where you will put in a resource qualifier for some other language and make sure that it works in that environment. And the other thing is screen size. And with the screen size, we're likely to have a different layout if it's screen size. So. On a bigger screen, we might have more room for images. On a smaller screen, we may have less room for images. So we might display more images on a big screen, less images on a smaller screen. Any questions about this? Not necessarily devices, but like classes of devices. All right. So, for example, um, you know, um, initially there were Android phones that had a certain screen size. Over time, tablets evolved, where there are tablets. And in addition, there's even different size tablets. There's this one that's, I think, like seven inches big. And there's another one that I think is like 10 inches big, all right, like about the same size as an iPad, all right. So we know that there's these, these different classes of, of, um, of, of Android devices, the, the um, small handheld phones, the little tablets, and the big tablets. And we know that that's something that's likely to be relevant to our application. Depending on the context of the application, right? Now, for a simple tip calculator, it's probably not that big of a deal. But if you're talking about a game, maybe, or if you're talking about something that, uh, where, where the, the screen layout was at a premium, you might want to create, uh, create on the tablet stuff that takes advantage of the bigger size on the tablet. So you know the different class of the device, the different sizes and all that, and you know that that might be relevant to something that you're trying to do. So then you'd create alternative resources. Um, 
internationalizing it. You know, you know that if you're creating a, an application that um, you plan on using outside the United States, that you want to have it um, localized so that it, it uses uh, the appropriate language for that. Um, and therefore, as such, you would likely create as many of those resource files as you could because that would, again, that would make your application work um, very well in other languages. Uh, if someone happened to install it in a language that you didn't support, it would simply revert to the default, which would more than likely be English. And given that many people do speak English, that's probably your safest bet. But you can do better than that, right? Um, if you think about it, you know, in, in just about any other platform that you think of, you have to work hard to do something like this, right? To, if you imagine that to inter internationalize a web page, you know, not to say you couldn't do it, but you'd have to develop some sort of mechanism of your own to do that because there's really nothing you know, built into HTTP that allows that easily anyhow. Where here's something, this is built into the platform and you can take advantage to, uh, of it and you can do uh, some cool stuff with it. So that I would say would be a consideration. And then finally, as I mentioned, screen definition, you know it, it would be... Um, uh, you know, um, or screen density rather, you know that that would be likely an issue because if you don't take into account for that, then your application is going to look a lot different on a high density device. Everything's going to look tiny, all right, and and you won't really be able to 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 won't be as as usable. So you're going to use DPs to make it bigger. That's the one thing that you can do, and you also have multiple versions of things like your icons and other images to take into account that. Well, keep in mind that a lot of, that things can be done a lot of different ways. All right, so so keep in mind um, that. Um, I guess, you know, I mean, to, to give a, a, a parallel to, to this, you know, Amazon is a gigantic website, right? Yeah, I mean, it uses HTML just like everyone else does, and it uses server-side scripts and all that. There's just more of it, all right, and there's a lot of it. So for bigger applications, to be sure, um, you know, there are some involved things. There's multiple screens, which again, the applications that we're looking at now are typically just one screeners. We'll look at some later on that uh, involve multiple screens. All right. But the idea is, is that, and the idea that I want to emphasize is built in the platform from the start is the support for multiple different platforms, that is, multiple different size devices, multiple different screen densities, multiple different languages. So, yeah, you know, if you really want to do this full blown, there'd be a lot of work to do and, and to put in there and to do all those things. But the nice thing is, is a lot of that is built into the framework. In other words, I didn't have to touch my code to do a French version of it, right? I simply you know, you'd simply find someone that speaks French or use Google Translate and boom, just change all your strings. And there you have it. As opposed to you having to deal with all that stuff yourself. So, yeah, it would be a lot of work to create a real robust application that did all these things and all that. But at the very least, the framework gives you sort of an infrastructure to build that within, you know, as opposed to having to code everything on your own. Which, which, or coming up with the infrastructure yourself to do that. So, it, it's it is it, it is yeah it, it is again you know um, you know on the other hand you know well there's some cool applications that are pretty simple you know so. Um, you know. But again, you're right. It's going to take a lot of time. Oh, 
Okay, good question. The question came up, could you incorporate a database into an Android app? And the question before that was kind of, um, kind of asking, is this like a server-side platform? Is this like a client or what? Keep in mind that this is a little different than a web environment where you have a clear client and server. This is a device, and the app we install on it runs on this device. So it's really neither a client nor a server because no one's asking it. Like, I, I put my simple tip calculator on here. No one is asking this device to calculate the tip. This device can do it, right? But it's not a server in the sense that no one's asking it for, gee, how much is the tip on this size of a meal? On the same token, it's not really a client either, right? Because it's not asking anyone else. It's doing everything on its own. So the applications are native to this device and they're standalone, all right? So in that respect, the applications we've looked at so far, client server doesn't really fit in. This is a different beast. It's, it's like the old days when you'd go and you'd write, an assembly language program on a mainframe. A mainframe isn't a server. You know, no one's asking it anything. It's not a client. It's not asking anyone. It's doing the whole job itself. All right, so it's sort of a self-contained world. Now, to your second question, can you have a database in an application? Yes, you can. All right, there is a SQLite database, and we'll go over an example later on um, in uh, um, in the semester. Well, we'll take and we'll store something in a database. So you could store small amounts of stuff in a database. Now, that being said, all right, um, you also can do things where you send requests to web servers to store something. This is a so-called cloud-based storage, all right? And I suppose in that context, it might act like a client, all right? I'm going to give you an example, Google Docs, all right? I can get Google Docs on my Android device, or you could probably get it on an Apple device too. The storage of those documents is out in the cloud. It's out on Google servers. But I can access those servers and save it back up to the cloud so in that respect, in that particular situation, this device would be a client to the Google server and would be saving stuff up there. So there's a lot of different um, possibilities in how an application can be architected. All right. So yes, this device could make requests to a, a web server. Take, for example, the weather application. Right? That, in that application, is acting like a client because this guy doesn't know what the weather is outside. This guy connects to some site out there that keeps track of the weather and downloads and shows me the, uh, that. And if I don't have an internet connection, it's not going to show me the updated weather. It's going to show me the weather the last time I did have an internet connection. On the other hand, if I were to download a tic-tac-toe game, let's say, or I'll download a little sketch application where I can go and sketch things on my pad. In that case, it's not really working as a client because it's, it's not interacting with anything out on the web. Probably not anyhow. It's just doing everything standalone on that particular device. So again, could be a client in some circumstances to another server. It's not going to be a server. It might be sort of a standalone, everything runs on this guy device as well. Other questions on this? Okay. There are apps that essentially, yeah, uh, they're essentially a, a Android front end to something that runs on the web. Like, for example, you know, there's an eBay app, right? You know, you could download an eBay app. You know, eBay's been running for years, right? There are server-side scripts. There's stuff on the web that does that stuff. Essentially, what the eBay app would be would be something that is 
very focused and something that kind of serves as a different front end, a convenient front end to those to that code that lives on that server. All right. So in other words, you place a bid on your on your mobile device. It's going to work just like you want to place a bid there. It's going to send a message to the server saying, "Hey, Mike just bid fifty dollars on this item," and then the server's going to process it and so on. So yeah, in that respect, it is communicating with the server and getting back information. Well, actually, if I'm not mistaken, one of our first, one of the first few apps that we do, I have to review the book to see exactly where it fits, is a Twitter search where you, in, you key in some um, search term to, to search for Twitter, you know, search for Twitter on Syria, to search for Twitter on PHP or, or Nokia or whatever, all right? And it runs out to the web and, and, and pulls recent Twitter posts uh, on that subject, all right? And again, there you'll see an example of running out to the web and getting some information and bringing it back and displaying it. So yeah, apps definitely can do that sort of thing. Other questions? If you have not already, um, make sure that your des de the development environment is set, you know, so that you can do this on your machine. And also be sure that you download the DDO applications that are listed on the book. Um, apparently you do have to register, but I'm pretty sure it's free to register, and then you can download uh, their sample applications. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I'll have to look at the syllabus to know for sure, but if I'm not mistaken, our next app that we're going to look at is Deedle's calculator, which is sort of a more full-blown version of the calculator. It does has some nifty little bells and whistles um, that's in, in some respects similar to our calculator, but um, a little more involved. Questions? Your next assignment, your first assignment was just to run some things and get some screenshots of that. So that was really largely a test to make sure that you have the development environment up and running. Your next assignment, your second assignment, is to do a simple rock, paper, scissors application. All right? Let's think briefly of what you're going to need for that. All right? You're going to need a strings file to contain all your hard-coded strings. All right? That's one thing. You're going to need a GUI, all right? What's going to be on that GUI? What's going to be on the GUI? You could have pictures of rock, paper, and scissors. You need some way for the human player to make their selection, right? So you either need a spinner control, radio buttons, all right? Those would be your two logical choices. You could have radio buttons with the pictures next to it. You could have a spinner control like we had for um, the quality of the meal, all right? You're going to need a button, all right? So that's what you're going to need on the GUI. And then you're going to need a label to say who won. Did you win or did the computer win? All right, so spinner control, probably, a button, and a label that says the results. What are you going to need code-wise? What's your code going to need to do? Well, you have a button. You're going to have to create a listener for that button, right? And the listener of that button is going to handle what happens when that button gets pressed. All right. When that button gets pressed, what are you going to do? Well, you're going to grab your answer, your user's answer, whether they picked rock, paper, or scissors. You're going to grab that from the spinner control. All right. You probably will have a separate rock, paper, and paper, scissors class that will go and that you'll pass to it the user's choice. 
it will randomly generate an option for the computer, for the Android device. Then it will apply the rock, paper, scissor rules to say who won. All right? So the rock, paper, scissor rules, pretty easy. You know, I'm, I'm pretty sure we all know them. If not, I can, can review them. All right? And then the object will say, will return back what the choice was of the computer and who won. All right? Computer won or it was a draw or the person won. So your button handler isn't going to do the evaluation itself. It's going to call this class. It's going to create, a, create an object, maybe set some parameters, make a call, get something out. And then the handler will go and then format and display the results on the page. So structurally, even though it does something different, in terms of structure, it's a lot like the simple tip calculator. All right? Because there's a class that contains the rules for the simple tip calculator, just like there's a class that's going to contain the rules for rock, paper, scissors. There's the view. It doesn't have any of the rules logic, doesn't have any of the processing logic, but it's sort of the glue that brings everything together. Brings the GUI together and has the event when the user presses a button to invoke methods on that class and to get the answer and to display the results. So at an overview level, this is the same application as that. It's just changing the details and changing the way that it behaves. All right. So review the example. I have posted the simple tip calculator example so you can review that. And um, let me know if you have any questions concerning that. Um, I guess that's all for today. Uh, any other questions? Going once, twice, sold. All right, we'll see you next time.